tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by Fume. Cold turkey may be great to order at your local deli counter, but as far as for bad habit breaking, I'm here to tell you there's a better way. And no, we're not talking about deals with the devil or making a blood pact with your spooky neighbor. We're talking about our sponsor, Fume, and they look at the problem in a different way. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from not-so-great habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code HORROR to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com and use code HORROR to save an additional 10% off your order today. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening, listeners, and welcome back to Horror Hill. As always, I'm your host, Eric Peabody. And I've got a particularly interesting story to share with you all tonight, and actually for the next two episodes as well. Now, you might be asking yourself what sort of tale could warrant triple episode coverage. Rest assured, this one should hold your attention for two good reasons. First, it's one hell of a ride. Second, the author of this story is also the main character. Tonight, we'll be reading the first portion of Mark Rowland's The Eyes of Amityville. I'm sure that many, if not all of you, know about the infamous house in Amityville, New York, which has been the site of rumored hauntings for decades following a night of horrific violence in 1974. What you might not know is that the house itself is still standing, though the various owners over the years have taken steps to deter ghost-hungry tourists. Of specific note, the iconic quarter-circle windows have been removed to make the house less recognizable. In tonight's story, Mr. Rowland tells us about how those very same windows came into his possession, and will begin to see the toll that it took on both him and his family. Also, a tale of this length warrants some extra pizzazz. Along those lines, I'd like to welcome Danielle Hewitt, who will be performing three roles in this story. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our... Uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, 
You wouldn't happen to still have all of your organs, would you? And now, from author Mark Rowland, I give you The Eyes of Amityville, Part 1. Prologue The home at 112 Ocean Avenue, Amityville, New York, is undoubtedly the most famous haunted house in the entire world. George and Kathy Lutz provided a tale that spawned a multitude of books, films, and random media that shows no sign of slowing anytime soon. But was the haunting real? That, obviously, is debated. But what I do know is that the confirmed events that happened in that house would be more than adequate to produce a negative energy strong enough to remain there to this very day, ever present in each item that was in the vicinity on that fateful morning. Regardless of the legend that became of it, I've always believed, until very lately, that the acts of actual human evil that went on in that home far eclipse anything that a ghost could possibly be capable of. In the early morning hours of November 13th, 1974, six members of the DeFeo family were gruesomely gunned down in their own beds. The victims were Ronald, father, 43, Luis, mother, 43, Dawn, daughter, 18, Allison, daughter, 13, Mark, son, 13, and John, son, 9. One member of the family is missing on that list, however. Ronald Jr., who was 23 at the time, entered a local bar at around 6.30 p.m. on November 13th and pleaded for help because he had found his parents dead in the home. The authorities were called and proceeded to search the DeFeo house, finding six bloody bodies, all positioned face down, deceased upon their crimson-stained mattresses. The scene was unreal. Ronald Jr., also known as Butch, was quick to pin the murders on a local mob connection, but authorities weren't buying what Ronnie was selling. Within a day, Ronald Jr. himself had confessed to committing all of the murders. He stated that afterwards, he took a bath, got dressed, and disposed of his bloody clothes, as well as the Marlin rifle he used and the cartridges. He then went to work, as he normally would. There were many motives provided for the murders, even some by Ronnie himself. Some thought he killed them to collect on life insurance, and some believed he was simply tripping out on LSD when he did it. His own story has varied as the years have passed, but the initial claim he used to strengthen his insanity plea was that he heard voices in his head which spurred him to kill his entire family. Ronald Jr. was eventually found guilty of each murder and would spend the rest of his life behind bars. One thing has always been puzzling about the murders, though. There was no silencer on Ronnie's rifle. After he began his rampage, it is unusual that all of the family members would stay still in their beds and not try to flee for their lives. So, the question is posed. Was there a second shooter? Or was something a little more otherworldly at play? One of the versions of the night's events, provided by Ronnie himself many years later, was that his sister Dawn had initially assisted with the murders. Apparently, according to this version, the mother and father were the only ones to be killed, but Dawn went ahead and killed the children too, which sent Ronnie into a rage. Ronnie then added Dawn to the list of the night's casualties. Unfortunately, as Ronnie had changed his story so many times over the years, there's no way to truly believe anything he's claimed. We will get no further versions of the story from Ronnie, though, as he passed away while still incarcerated on March 12, 2021. Unfortunately, the story still continues on, as I am the living, breathing proof. Read on, judge for yourselves. Mark Rowland, February 23rd, 2023. Chapter 1. Transference. I'm a man of very peculiar tastes, always was. Some would call me an eccentric, 
But then again, in my line of work, you kind of have to be. As a writer of the somewhat dark and disturbing, it's my job to continually progress, to incrementally push the envelope with each new tale I provide for public consumption. At some point in every author's life, however, true inspiration begins to fade a bit. You have your entire life to work out your breakout novel, but what then? As the fame comes, so does the expectation. Deadlines become a thing. Waiting around for some magical muse to provide you with your next idea is no longer an option, unless you want your publisher to drop you from the great heights back into obscurity and back into story submission hell. I had worked much too hard for far too long to make such an idiotic mistake, so I tend to cheat a little. I decided long ago that I would never again be wanting for that next great, horrific idea. No more writer's block, no more twiddling my thumbs as my eyes burned from the sickening dead glow of a computer screen devoid of a single character. Time is money, and every second spent not taxing the keyboard is a simple waste of it. The plan consisted of creating an atmosphere to work in where an unspeakable notion or burnt offering would only be fingertips away. A place where evil could live and teach with the simple murmurings of a whisper. And so, I descended from the fictional perch I was so very used to and dipped my toe into the pool of the real. A place where monsters roamed freely, beyond the constraints of the fairy tales we had all become conditioned to. As they say, real life is much scarier than fiction. And so, I became a collector of what is known to the public as murderabilia. Crime scene relics, pieces of art created by killers, even some of the clothing they once wore. Nothing was off-limits in this new world of depravity I had decided to enter. These pieces adorned the walls of my newly renovated writing room in the attic, away from the wife and hidden from the children. A little Gacy here, a little bit of Dahmer there, maybe a pinch of Ramirez in the corner. The inspirations were there for the taking, and the energies which emanated from the items were very real indeed. Oh, and the words? They flowed easily and freely, without much prodding from me whatsoever. From the very first piece I had acquired, I knew I was hooked. I could sit down, hold a tainted item in my hands, and transfer the energy onto the screen without second-guessing one damned thing. I felt... possessed. But in a good way, of course. My wife was not happy at all with the plan I had concocted. But, as she was never happy with anything I did anyways, it didn't bother me one bit. Jessica and I had been at odds for years. As my career took off and she finally had to accept that I was actually good at something, the seeds of jealousy broke through the stony ground of our regular, boring life with a godlike force. It became all about me, and she fucking hated that. She was no longer Jessica, but instead, award-winning author Mark Rowland's wife and the more money I made, the more disgusted she seemed to become. The job she worked quickly became unnecessary, and when I suggested that she could quit and spend more time at home with me and the kids, you would have thought I had admitted some terrible infidelity to her by the way she had reacted. The irony of the situation was absolutely mind-blowing. I was doing something amazing with my life, and all she could think about was herself. In hindsight, if it wasn't for our two kids, I believe Jessica would have left me as soon as I signed with my publisher for my first novel. We played our roles for our children and for the public, but deep down, our relationship was drowning, word by word and book by book. Women are strange folk, but so are men, I suppose. This collection of mine quickly took on a life of its own. As my museum of death grew, however, my stories shifted. My tales were no longer in the traditional vein of horror, but they instead took on a more hardcore, sensual type of disturbing, where the selling points became the visuals, the tastes, and the smells of death itself. The devil was in the details. I needed to take the readers where they had not gone before. 
I needed to let them become witness to the actual destruction of the flesh and all that it entailed. Total sensory overload through the written word. And so, my sales, as well as my reputation, grew exponentially. As was the plan, of course. I monetized evil, whether it was fictional or not. Success through any means necessary. I began to feel, although my collection was something to truly behold, that it would somehow remain unfinished, no matter what new trinket I added to it. From the very beginning, I was after something. Something I wanted, but knew I might never receive, no matter how hard I searched. It was something that I held very dear to my heart, ever since I was a little child. High hopes, of course. Ocean Avenue, Amityville. The haunted house of haunted houses. I wanted a piece of it. I knew, if I had that in my possession... I could create a fucking absolute masterpiece of the sick and disturbing. I had often joked when the house went up for sale a few years back that it could be such an investment for the right bunch of folks. Think about it. The most famous bed and breakfast in the entire world. A customer could choose the room they wanted to stay in, pick their meal, even watch the original film if they wanted. Amazing. And you could charge a shitload though it would honestly be worth every penny. There was only one thing that had bothered me, though. Whoever the owners were in the 80s, they had made a conscious decision to not only change the address, but remove those quarter-moon windows that the house was so very famous for. The eyes of death themselves. Gone. A bunch of fucking fools, if you ask me. You can't change history, no matter how hard you may try such a missed opportunity. So, a few years into my obsession, you can imagine my utter disbelief as I received some information that these very windows still existed and were preserved by the same construction company that removed them in the first place. The holy grail of murderabilia. Mine? For the taking? If the opportunity was real, I would not let it slip away. After a simple phone call to a company called T&J Remodeling out of Long Island, New York, I was positively assured that they did still have the same windows from the old DeFeo residence. They seemed relatively annoyed at the call and nearly hung up on me until I told them exactly who I was. Fame sometimes has its advantages, obviously. After bullshitting a while about my latest book, I was able to set up an appointment to see exactly what these folks had in storage. I still wasn't sold on it, though I was more than willing to take a little trip out there to see for myself. If nothing else, I could take a look at the actual house on Ocean Avenue, albeit a drive-by. I couldn't imagine the residents being overly excited about another weirdo asking about their home even if the weirdo happened to be best-selling author Mark Rowland himself. Worse yet, they might be big fans, and I wouldn't want to get stuck there signing autographs for their friends and family all afternoon. I don't like the whole autograph thing. Personally, I don't understand what folks see in me or my work. I'm a hack, plain and simple. I had to borrow my friend's Ford for the excursion, as I knew my current automobile situation would not allow for the transport of these large pieces if I could somehow make a deal. Jessica knew I was up to some shit as soon as I pulled in the driveway. She was on my ass before I could even open the door. Please tell me you didn't buy a truck. Mark, seriously. Jess's tone was typical. Of course not. I have a line on those items I was telling you about the other day. Have to take something that can transport them. She was already shaking her head as we spoke, with her brow furrowing deeper and deeper. It almost looked like an upside-down smiley face forming above her eyes. I focused on it moving about as she began her scolding. Come on, how much shit do you need up there? And where the hell are you going to put two full-size windows? Stick them in a frame? Tape them to the wall? She was now moving her hands to and fro. Jess, we've been over this. It helps me write. You like the money, don't you? I'm onto something big here. Really, really big. Maybe the best thing I've ever done. 
What don't you understand? I nearly pulled out of the driveway as my anger grew. Just drive away. Fuck it. It's strange, Mark, and not in a good way. When it was you, just coming up with these creepy stories by yourself, that was one thing. But these items, with these histories, they scare me. And if they affect you in such a way, then what the hell does that say about you? Maybe it's time you gave it up. Get back to normal? Jess looked down at the driveway, all the while playing her hand. I had a pretty good poker face myself. Christ, Jess, I can't believe we're doing this again. All right, I'll level with you. This is the last time, the last piece of the puzzle, and when I'm finished with the book, I'll get rid of all of it. Except for the windows. They stay, because I want to have them installed in place of the old ones, in the attic. I smirked at her. She fired a stabbing glance back at me. You're kidding, right? I didn't answer her question, because I didn't need to. Chapter 2 The Purchase The six-hour drive from my little shit town in Pennsylvania to Long Island, New York was nothing to sniff at, especially since I'm not a fan of being alone for long periods of time. Sure, writing is a solitary thing at its nature, but during those moments my creativity proves to be quite good company. Real loneliness, on the other hand, is very different. The past can kill you if you let it, and I was already busy digging my grave one memory at a time. And yes, during those six hours my mind traveled back to those dark times, when my tears were many, my friends were few and my greatest enemy lived right there in my own home. The problems between me and my wife ran much deeper than simple jealousy. Years ago, when we were newly married and I'd not yet even dipped my toe into my current profession, infidelity did, indeed, rear its ugly head. I'm not really sure what happened when I found out. Some may call it a nervous breakdown. Others may call it the act of simply losing your shit. But yes, in one singular moment, everything I had been working for in my life simply fell away, and all the walls I hid behind came tumbling down, until nothing was left but the raw nerve. I remember the smug look on her face as I confronted her. It was obvious that she was proud of her actions. I am not a violent man by nature, but in that moment, I did make an exception. Jess was surprised as my hands tightened around her throat, though she shouldn't have been. What did she expect? I took my vows seriously, as any man should. I became the hand of God for a single moment, but at the end of the day, I showed her mercy. We attempted to move on, but within a few weeks, the true pain came to light. Jess was pregnant and I already knew that it wasn't mine. But there was more that factored into the equation. We already had a six-year-old son, Jack, and Jack needed me. So I stayed. Sacrifice is important, isn't it? By the time I pulled into the parking lot of T&J Remodeling, I was already emotionally drained and ready to call it a day. Unfortunately, there was much more to do. Tom, I think that rider fella's here. I spotted a gangly young man motioning with his hand from the open warehouse door. I walked across the lot towards the building and was met in an instant by a much older and grizzled looking fellow, wearing dirtied overalls and a painter's cap. Mr. Roland, so glad you could visit us. We don't get too many famous folks around here. My name's Tom. I'm the T in the name. The J passed away a long while ago. The man offered me a handshake and I obliged. His palm was calloused and rough and his grip was more than firm. You can tell so much from a man's handshake. He had obviously busted his ass his entire life. I spent mine typing. I felt a little less than in his presence, which made no sense at all. Regardless, I was indebted to this man for opening up on a Saturday to deal with my needs. I'm sorry to hear that, Tom. I appreciate you having me, though. I know it's a hell of a strange request, considering the circumstances. 
And please, call me Mark. I never considered myself as a Mr. Anything. A little too formal for my blood. Well, Mark, a strange request indeed. And you weren't the first one who's asked about those windows. We normally just hang up on a person, but when I heard it was you, I had to make an exception. See, most folks around here want to bury the past, and us business owners, we do what it takes to earn the public trust. But I have to be honest with you. My wife is your biggest fan. When I told her you had inquired about those windows, she almost shit herself. She would slay me dead if she knew I turned you down. Tom laughed heartily, as did I. Yeah, you did happen to mention that on the phone. I always appreciate a fan. What's your favorite book of mine, if I may ask? I had to play the game. I have to tell you, Mark, my wife talked about the Sawtooth Fairy for months after she read it. My Joan couldn't wrap her head around that twist ending. If I was more of a reader, I bet I'd enjoy it too. That's the normal response from a fan of mine. That was my first book. It was easy, and it was fun practically wrote itself. Ah, that's a good answer. It's my favorite, too. So, what's the story on these windows, anyway? God, I hated talking about my work. Time to redirect. Well, the windows themselves were removed in the 1986-87 time frame, I think, at the request of the owners. Can't say I blame them. Creepy fucking things, considering what happened. So you were there, in the home itself? I was intrigued. No, that was before my time, when my brother owned the business. He did tell me about it, though. Said there was nothing different about that place than any other he'd ever worked on, and he definitely didn't believe in ghost stories. You don't fall for that stuff, do you, Mark? Tom smirked at me and cocked his head slyly. I wouldn't say ghosts, necessarily. But I do believe that certain events leave energy behind. Actually, I'm hoping these windows will help me write my next book. Think of it as an inspiration of sorts. There was a bit of silence as Tom looked kind of surprised and stared at me like I had three heads. Well, different strokes for different folks, I guess. What say we have a look? Finally, one step closer. I followed Tom into the building. The warehouse was larger than I had expected, judging from what it looked like on the outside. Tom led me past rows upon rows of boxed windows, doors, and desks until we reached the very back wall of the establishment. In the far right corner, there they were, leaning against some shelving. The eyes of Amityville. The windows seemed intact, although they were covered by about an inch of dust and filth. I lost my breath for a moment. It all became so very real as I approached the masterpieces I had so often thought of. I rubbed my hand over the top of one of the frames, then sneezed at the plume of dust that formed. Yep, they are pretty dirty. Been sitting there in that spot since they came in the door, I'd think. But clean them up a little bit and they're going to be good as new. We'll even package them for you nice and tight for the trip home. Tom became the salesman at the drop of a hat. Tom, I gotta say, I'm pretty amazed. I wasn't sure if you were on the level or not, but just by looking at him, I know you aren't bullshitting me. I can feel it. Eight grand, four per window. What do you say? I wasn't fucking around. Well, that's definitely an offer to consider. I just can't believe someone would want these things. There's still a part of me that does want to keep the past buried, right here in this warehouse. You know... Let the dead sleep. Let Amityville move on. I just don't know. I couldn't believe it. This fucker was starting to bust my balls. But I already had a plan. Understood. But I can offer more than money. Now what about this? You let me out of here with these windows, and I'll mention you and your wife in my next book. How's that sit? News of this would get old Tom laid tonight for sure. He paused as the implications set in. Are you fucking serious? Joan's gonna lose it. You got a deal, Mr. Roland. Tom nearly tripped over his own feet as he danced some tiny jig of glee. I laughed along. Before I knew it, Tom and his helper were packaging my prizes up and helping me move them out to the bed of the truck. I had done it. 
In disbelief at what I had just purchased, I made the quick five-minute drive over to Ocean Avenue so I could see firsthand what the DeFeo story was all about in the first place. I had dreamed about visiting the house for many years, and I was glad I could finally say that I could make it happen. I parked directly across the street and sat there for a while, as I noticed that there were more than a few onlookers already scattered about, ogling away right in front of the house. I spotted a random car stop right behind a few of them and heard the driver shout something loudly at the tourists. I definitely didn't want to add to the spectacle. I couldn't help but wonder how the latest owners must feel. The lack of privacy, the connection to one of the most notorious crimes in history. Was it as burdensome as they had feared? I heard that they had cut one hell of a deal on the price, but I can't imagine dollars making up for the situation they willingly jumped into. The home itself looked exactly as I imagined it would. Stately, large, and more than perfect, illuminated by a beautifully bright summer's day. But of course, it was missing its eyes. Those were in the back of the truck. And yes, someday soon, I knew I would be seeing through those eyes myself. The trip home was much, much different than the trek to New York. There were no memories, no tears, and no pain. Only excitement. My mind raced with ideas for the new book, to the point where I actually started to write it, deep in the recesses of my brain. My muse was already hard at work, bestowing upon me the tools I needed to come up with another bestseller. And I was honestly banking on it being my last. I wanted to create my final masterwork, the thing that I would be remembered for long after my bones would become one with the soil, and the title of my manuscript would be more than appropriate. We Deal in Pain. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by Fume. As I mentioned earlier, sponsor Fume looks at things in a different way. Instead of completely erasing your undesirable habits, why not just remove the bad elements from them? Thanksgiving is finally upon us, and the rest of the year will fly by afterward. Why not get a head start on those New Year's resolutions? We all have goals that we'd like to achieve, with habits we'd more than love to leave behind. Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that can help you do just that. Instead of electronics, fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, fume uses flavored air. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. I was curious myself at first and found myself pleasantly surprised by the flavors. Whether you enjoy a classic citrus flavor or the fresh taste of white cranberry due to the holiday season, Fume has you covered. Fume is fresh, delicious air at your fingertips with no harsh smells left behind on your hands, breath, and clothing. Also, Fume is made naturally. There's no electricity needed, which makes the places you can take it limitless. Because tensions are high around the holiday season, the last thing you need is the aggravation of fighting over chargers. You get what I'm saying. Instead of bad, fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easier. I really enjoy how the shape and quality of the real wood piece is super sleek, fancy looking, and light. And because it's flavored, vaporized air and not harmful or altering chemicals, you can enjoy your fume with you on the go. Fume mouthpieces come with an adjustable airflow dial and are designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting. This provides your fingers with an opportunity to fidget, which is helpful for taking the edge off. Mother always said that idle hands were the devil's playground, after all. <laughs> Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to fume is easy, enjoyable, and can even be fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Keep your mouth busy and your conscience clean. Not all habits have to be bad for you. Let's create better ones together. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code HORROR to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. 
That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com and use code HORROR to save an additional 10% off your order today. Chapter 3 Settling In I returned home with my treasure at around 9 p.m. It had been an extremely long day, and I was obviously exhausted. I had stopped off for dinner earlier, but I probably shouldn't have. It made the last leg of my journey unbearable. My eyes struggled to stay open. All I wanted now was some sleep. I received irritation instead. For the most part, I enjoy the street on which I reside. A nice area, mainly well-to-dos, or at least better-offs. It's a beautiful, straight, tree-lined street that could serve as a backdrop for countless films or paintings. Aesthetically perfect. But the neighbors, they are a fucking mess. And the very worst of them lives right next to me. Goddamned Harold. He's the kind of dude who cuts his grass with a manual mower like it's 1955. The kind of guy who takes weeks to replace an entire wooden retaining wall yet didn't have the forethought to waterproof or stain the wood, so it rots and needs to be redone within five years. I even spotted this fella caulking his roof, in shorts, on a snowy, below-freezing day, just because he got a hair up his ass that his roof was going to leak on that very particular day. A real head case. And even worse, he's up in everyone's business. I did not need him snooping around in mine. Hey, neighbor, you need any help with that? Fuck, he spotted me. No, buddy, I'm good. Thanks, though. I quickly heaved the large, wrapped window out of the bed of the truck. Just leave me alone, Harold. Are those windows? Doing some remodeling? Harold continued on as he jumped into the bed of the truck and began to untie the second window. Jesus Christ. Not exactly. These are actually antiques. They're from the house in Amityville. Harold stopped in his tracks and looked up at me. What house? One from the movies? You're joking. Ah, here we go. No joke. From the house where all those people got murdered. Not the movie house, though. The real one. I smirked. Man, why the hell would you want these? That's more than a little creepy. He jumped out of the truck. I guess my helper was done being helpful. Yeah, I guess it is, but it's a means to an end. I was having trouble on my new book. I'm hoping this might open up some new avenues of creativity, know what I mean? Before I could even finish the sentence, Harold was walking away, shaking his head and murmuring something under his breath. He never did approve of what I did for a living. Not that I cared. As I carefully lugged each window into the house, I was greeted by Emily and Jack, who were always happy to see their dad. Daddy, what did you bring us? Emily tugged on my pant leg. My girl. Oh, baby P, Daddy didn't get you guys anything. It was a business trip. No toy store this time. Emily started to pout as the next in line took her place. Dad, don't forget you gotta help me with my math for Monday. I got that test I was telling you about. You know, the flashcards I need. I was impressed. I didn't give a damn about school at that age. I didn't forget, Jack. We'll work on it bright and early tomorrow, right after breakfast, okay? I looked over at Jess, who was sitting on the couch, busy on a glass of bourbon. Probably her third, if I had to guess, considering the time of night. Hey, honey, I'm home. I playfully announced over the din of the children. Jess looked at me briefly, shook her head with disapproval, and left the room. I wasn't expecting anything less. Such is life, I guess. Although the windows were not yet installed, their mere presence brought on a creative appetite that could not be sated. I set up shop in my writing room, as usual, and pecked away with some of the most beautifully deviant material I had ever read, much less come up with myself. I worked for days, molding chapter after chapter, formulating a true beast of a story. My agent, Daniel, was more than glad to hear it. The publisher had been clamoring for material and was waiting on me to provide. 
There had been some issues in the past, as I had briefly hinted at earlier. Hence, this whole demented plan I had set into motion. A few years ago, I was almost dropped from my deal and nearly sued for a breach of contract. Daniel kissed so much ass for me, I will never be able to repay him for what he did. But one thing was for sure. I was never going to put him in such a spot ever again. About a week or so into my project, the local window place I had hired began to work on the actual installation of the frames. I was hopeful that it wouldn't be too much of a problem, as we lived in a Dutch colonial-style home already with a very similar styling of window. Those quarter moons are simply gorgeous, regardless of what morbid history they're connected to. I took a break from the writing for a few days and let the transplant take place. That's exactly what it felt like, too. I watched as the patient was prepped and sedated. The tools were all laid out. The air was imbued with a kind of nervous energy. After all, surgery is nothing to take lightly. Without hesitation, the doctors cut away at the bone of the house and removed the tainted organs. The blood of the sawdust covered the floor in its entirety. They then widened the skeletal orbits with ease and simply attached the nerves of the new, capping everything off with a beautiful Victorian trim, an added bonus. It was one hell of a facelift, and by the time they were completed, you couldn't even tell any work had been done at all. Precision, accuracy, and speed. It was impressive, to say the least. But did it work? As the workers were leaving and the sun was beginning to set, I entered my writing room, closed the door behind me, and slowly approached the windows. I'm not sure if my mind was already playing tricks on me, but I felt an immediate chill enter the room. Looking out through the glass onto my dimly lit street, I thought back to Ronnie and wondered how many times he had looked out of these same panes of glass onto a world that he never truly felt a part of. That was a piece of the puzzle I've not yet mentioned to you. Yes, the windows were from the house itself, but more precisely, they were from Ronnie's bedroom. The fear that he felt. He was looking out, but was something else looking in? My mind snapped back to the present as I noticed a single black fly crawling slowly along the newly installed trim. I pressed my thumb onto it and threw it into the wastebasket. I was about to go back downstairs as I was sure that dinner was probably ready, but I instead sat down at my laptop, wondering if I should maybe test out the waters. Honestly, the room already felt different, and so did I. I opened the laptop, hit the power button, and the glow of the screen commenced. The hum of my life's work became audible once again. To live or die by the written word. I experienced a mixture of excitement, intense focus, and even a little bit of anxiety as the icons populated the screen. I had now become the conduit, and it was time to produce. I opened up the file folder where the manuscript was kept, and it was gone, as if it had never even existed at all. Chapter 4 Traitor Technology is a hell of a thing, and at some point in our lives we've all lost something from a hard drive that we wish we could get back. But this, this was a little different. Losing ten chapters of a first draft for someone who deals with severe writer's block is kind of an issue. I must admit, I did panic as I realized that the file was gone. But I was not an idiot, not by any means. Right there, hiding in the drawer of my desk, was my savior. The good old thumb drive that I used to back up every story I've ever written. I popped the little guy into the USB port, waited for it to register, and opened up the drive, as easy as that. There was no way I was going to let a technological blip derail me. I double-clicked the file folder, and... Nothing. It simply wasn't there. My heart rate sped up, and I began to sweat. I thought I was having a heart attack. How could this be? 
My mind raced as I thought of every possible situation, even that I might be in the midst of a nightmare. But no, it was as real as it could possibly get. I settled on the only conclusion that made any sense. Jess, she had finally done it. Fuck! I shouted at the top of my lungs as the walls shook and the murderous items on the walls rattled on their hooks. I heard the clomping of feet coming up the stairs and the doorknob turning slowly as I anticipated what would surely happen next. My script was already written. Had been for years. But what would my ever-loving wife have to say? Mark, what the hell happened? Are you okay? She stood there, feigning concern as best as she could. She always was quite the actress. Oh, nothing, dear. It's just that someone deleted my entire goddamned manuscript. All of that work. Poof. Now who in the hell would get the bright idea to pull a stunt like that? Must have been a ghost. I pounded my fist on the desk and listened to the wood crackle under the weight of my anger. Oh, Mark, come on. What the hell are you talking about? You probably put it in the wrong folder or something. You know how forgetful you are sometimes. My anger only grew as I listened to her lies. Forgetful? Then how in the hell was it also deleted from the flash drive? What's your answer to that? I literally felt my blood pressure rise. I was ready to blow. I really hope you aren't insinuating what I think you are. Why on earth would I do such a thing? Do you really believe that I hate you that bad? To screw you over? To fuck us both over? You really have the nerve. Jess turned to leave, but I was not yet through. Not by a long shot. Really? Nerve! You are the absolute queen of fucking me over. Hell, I'm raising a kid that isn't even mine, and she doesn't know who her dad even is. You faked a paternity test, for Christ's sake. Don't you dare tell me about nerve. And there it was. I cannot fucking believe you just said that to me. I thought we were over that a long time ago. I paid for my sins, Mark. You know that. I have the scars to prove it. I could have put you in jail for a long time. Maybe I should have. Jess's tears began to flow, and her normally beautiful blonde hair began to glisten and become stringy with sweat. She was not expecting such an attack. All you people want to do is bury the past. But you can't. It fucking happened, and the damage you caused was real. I'm not a fucking robot like you. Never will be. And you speak of scars? Guess what? Flesh mends, but mental scars never heal. At this point, Jess ran out of the room and down the stairs. But I became alarmed at the sound of two sets of footsteps, not one. Fuck. I hoped to God that Emily hadn't been listening in. That night, as I rode the couch, I didn't sleep at all. My heart raced at the thought of failure, both in my writing and in my life. As my anger ceased, I thought back to what I had said to Jess and the implications it could have. Even though it was true, and even though I never got over the situation, I did not want to lose my family. My emotions had gotten the best of me, once again. And what about my career? I knew that there was no way that I could replicate the work I had done. Starting over wasn't a viable option. When in a state of true inspiration, a person needs to capture it right then, or else it'll be lost forever. Redoing it would be nothing but a half-assed watercolor copy of the Mona Lisa, and the question kept floating around in my head. What if Jess was somehow telling the truth? It was unlikely, but not impossible. Bright and early the next morning, I drove over to the neighborhood computer place with my laptop in tow. I had to try anything I could. I chuckled at the sign on the building before I touched the door. It was the word debug with an animated picture of a fly being zapped. I wondered how many times these guys were mistaken for exterminators. Yikes. And this was the place I was entrusting with the fate of my career? Even so, I entered the store with all the confidence I could possibly muster. What can we do for you, sir? 
The fellow behind the counter, with his bright blue uniform shirt and neatly parted hair, seemed relatively chipper for seven o'clock in the morning. Well, uh, Rick, as I quickly glanced at his name tag, I have one hell of a problem here. Somehow, some of my work got deleted, and I was hoping you could help me recover what was lost. You guys can do that, right? I read somewhere that it was possible. I was trying to play it cool, but inside, I was definitely shitting a brick. Yeah, there's no guarantee, but it is possible. With restore points and such, we can normally bring it back, or at least a previous version of the file. The only issues we really run into are when the files are corrupted or damaged. Let's give it a shot. I was glad that Rick was so confident. My heart rate slowed. I gave him the laptop and wished for the best. My career depended on it. So, what file name are we looking for, Mark? I gulped as he spoke my name. I hadn't mentioned it. Yes, Mr. Roland, I definitely recognize you. Who doesn't, especially in this town? Don't worry, though. I won't tell. Rick winked at me as he powered on the computer. I'm sorry. Still not used to being known, I guess. Never even thought I would be. Anyways, the file I'm looking for is named pain.docx in the new project folder. See what you can do. My fingers were crossed. Sure, just have a seat and I'll give it my best shot. It'll be a few minutes. Those next few moments seemed to last an eternity. So, what will it be? Finish the masterpiece or start all over again? And the fucking deadline... As I was deep in my thoughts, running over the options, the verdict arrived with impunity. The jurors were obviously unamused. I'm sorry, Mark. I'm kind of stumped here. That file name does not come up during any system restore point I checked in the last month of activity on your device. It doesn't exist. Nothing even close to that file name, either. What the fuck was he talking about? How can this be? I'm a hundred percent sure about the file name. Is there any way a person could have pulled this off? To seem like it wasn't even there? The anger from the previous night returned with a fervor. That fucking bitch. Unless there's some sort of tech wizard, I'd say a big fat no to that. I'm sorry, Mark. I know how bad it sucks losing files. He didn't know the half of it. I drove home with my tail between my legs, embarrassed, shocked, and simply confused. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I intended to get to the bottom of it, somehow. Regardless of my feelings, though, the task itself remained. I had a novel due in a month, and I was back at square one. I would have to live in that writing room all day, every day, to try and pull something like that off. Even then, it seemed like an impossibility, as if I'd already lost, and no crime scene relic was going to help me with that. I felt completely defeated, and for the first time in my life, I felt out of control. Chapter 5 The Trance Well, how did it go? Jess had obviously been waiting for me to get home, which was surprising. I was amazed that she was talking to me at all after the boatload of shit that I said to her the previous evening. If she did delete the file, she sure was putting up one hell of a good front. I still wasn't buying it, though. Not yet. No such luck. I think I'm fucked. I honestly don't know what I'm gonna do. I guess I'm gonna have to try to put something together, though. It's most likely going to suck, and it won't be nearly as good as what I had originally... But I have to give it a shot, which means a lot of time upstairs, more than I've ever spent before. I can't be bothered unless one of the kids are bleeding out or something. It's the only way. I was so beaten down mentally, it seemed like I was speaking in a whisper. A headache had been creeping in since the very moment I woke up. I felt like absolute shit. I definitely understand where you're at, Mark. You do whatever you have to do to get it done. I'll tell the kids what's going on, and I'm going to call work and let them know I'm going to be needing a little time. I'll do the kids, and you finish your project. But remember, you promised. The last book. Then back to normal, okay? 
She was being so fucking nice to me. Are you serious? Your boss is going to be pissed, isn't he? You might lose your job. Well, if they have a problem with it, they can go straight to hell. This is more important. I love you, honey, and I'm not giving up on you. I hadn't heard Jess speak to me like that in years. It was refreshing and enough for an actual loving embrace. Unbelievable. Without wasting any time, I ascended the stairs and entered my writing room. I took a minute and surveyed the walls. Any grain of inspiration was surely more than welcome at this point. I was going to need every bit of help I could possibly get. I sat at my desk, opened up my laptop, and performed that all-too-familiar duty of booting up my lifeline to the world. I opened up a blank document in Word, saved it under the exact same name that I had before, and attempted to recall those first words of the manuscript that I had lost. I sat and waited, but nothing came. Strangely enough, all of those stories from my past were at the ready. Every character, every storyline, except for the one I had just written a few weeks earlier. Droplets of sweat began to form on my forehead. My temperature rose, and my headache worsened. I stood up and began to pace as I listened to the weathered floorboards creak under the weight of a man who was obviously going through... something. What the hell is going on? I thought to myself as I struggled to come up with one piece of the story I was so invested in. The computer guy's words began to creep into my mind instead. It doesn't exist. I repeated it. It doesn't exist. Was it some sort of madness? Some figment of my imagination? I couldn't even remember the act of striking the keys or putting any words down at all. I stared at the blank document in disbelief as I noticed a black fly crawling on the screen. I attempted to smack it away, but the only thing I hit was the screen. It continued to move. I looked a bit closer and realized that the fly was not on the screen at all. It was in the screen itself, underneath, with its tiny legs furiously moving in some sort of staccato dance. I removed my eyeglasses, rubbed my eyes, and gave it another go. As I got even closer to the screen and attempted to tap at it, the fly jumped from it and flew past me. My heart skipped as reality bent right in front of my very eyes. Am I losing my mind? On the very verge of a full-blown panic, I raced towards those newly installed windows that I had been so very excited to acquire. I again looked out onto that perfect street on which my family resided. An eerie calm began to wash over me, and I immediately felt that everything was just as it was meant to be. No problems, no deadlines, and no fear. My heartbeat slowed, my muscles loosened, and my eyes began to close. Somehow, some way, in the midst of the largest challenge of his meaningless life, Mark Rowland went to sleep for a little while. I watched myself as I loaded and cocked the rifle, six shells in all. My hands shook, but make no mistake, there was no pause in the proceedings. The surroundings themselves were not unfamiliar to me. The walls were covered in that usual, trendy 1970s wood paneling, and I registered the overpowering scent of nicotine mixed with marijuana and the staleness of your usual basement. I noticed a pool table off to the left, with the billiards scattered about the vestiges of the final game to ever be played upon it, I would assume. There was some sort of war movie playing in the background as I readied myself for the tasking. I took a deep breath, moved up the stairs, and entered the first floor of the house where my previous suspicions were confirmed. The bright red carpeting and huge portraits on the wall said it all. This was not Mark Rowland's childhood home, no. It was high hopes itself. In November of 74, I would gamble. The air seemed electrified as every hair on my body began to stand on end. 
The chill of an uncertainty crept into me, as well as an appalling sense of dread. Physical sensation remained, though I had no control of my body's movements. I was an onlooker, watching a film commence that I shouldn't have even been a part of. The role was simply not mine to play. I ascended the stairs, but paused briefly at each golden-framed portrait that lined the staircase wall. I focused on the individual brush strokes, and at times even felt them with my fingertips. It was truly marvelous work, especially the masterpiece depicting the matriarch of the family. She looked regal, almost, unbefitting of the rest of the family. I would have sworn that it was a photograph if spotted from any other distance. I continued on my journey as I reached the landing of the second floor. My eyes locked onto one of the doors up ahead. Shall we begin, Mr. Roland? Are you ready? The doorknob was slowly and carefully turned, and the door inched open with the creeping push of the index finger. I warily switched on the light, though it did not seem to matter. The person in the bed did not wake. Before I knew it, I was right next to the mattress, watching the slow-moving plaid blanket rise and fall as the person underneath it breathed in and out. In and out. I could see the side of a young boy's face, but then the rifle I was holding was raised, somewhat impeding the view. I felt absolutely sick as the inevitable fell upon me. A dream this was not. Okay, Mark. Take a deep breath and do it. Without hesitation or action from me whatsoever, my finger yanked at the trigger, and I closed my eyes, afraid to see the results of what I had done. Strangely, no gunshot was heard. There was nothing but a high-pitched whine, piercing my mind in stereo from left to right, over and over again. I did not know what it was, but something forced my eyes open, as if it wanted or needed me to see the damage I had caused. My hand pulled the blanket back, and I saw the crimson stain expand outward, from the small, dark entry wound in the boy's blue pajama shirt onto the stark white sheets underneath. There seemed to be no end to the blood's movement. I wanted to stop it. I wanted to reverse time. I simply wanted out. After propping the rifle up against the mattress, my hands clutched at the small boy's shoulders and I turned his body over. There he was. But in some ghastly form of trickery, it was no member of the DeFeo family at all. It was my son, Jack, his face gray and lifeless, with blood dripping from the corners of his mouth. I fell backwards. As easily as I was sucked into the hell in which I had found myself, my body was spat back out, right onto the floor of my writing room. I immediately vomited as I regained my bearings and struggled to my feet, nearly slipping in the brownish mess I had created. I bolted out the door and down the stairs in a pure panic, nearly breaking my legs in the process. I rushed through Jack's bedroom door, and I witnessed the greatest thing I had ever seen in my entire life. Jack was on his bed, with his headphones on, listening to music. He was fine. Unfortunately, my entrance startled him to the point of snapping his headphone cord and nearly falling out of his bed. Dad, what's the matter? You scared the crap out of me. Is something wrong? I was out of breath and shaking, trying to come up with something to say. I'm... I'm so sorry, Jack. I... I just had a really bad feeling like something was wrong. I had to check on you. It's all good. Jack looked at me confusedly, then down at his busted headphones as I turned around and closed the door behind me. I motioned with the sign of the cross, then continued on downstairs. I could smell Jess hard at work, cooking up her latest concoction. Thank God. 
Wow, hon. You must have really gotten a lot done today. You were up there for six hours straight. How's it coming? What? Six hours? Impossible. There was no way I was out for that long. My head pounded as I struggled in vain to find an answer. Yeah, it was okay. Enough for a chapter or two, I guess. I'm not really feeling very well. I, uh, puked in the attic. Jess looked up from the stove, concerned. Holy shit, Mark. You look terrible. You should really go to bed. How bad of a mess is it? Do you want me to get it? Jess put her hand to my forehead and checked for a fever. No, hun. I appreciate the offer, though. I can get it. I just gotta take it slow. As I returned to the writing room with a few rags and a bottle of wood cleaner, a new thought entered my mind. Maybe I'd gone too far. In passing, I spotted a tiny crack forming in one of the panes of glass of my new windows. A crack was growing in me as well. You've been listening to the first part of The Eyes of Amityville by Mark Rowland. Well, my friends, that wraps up the first segment of our story. We will be continuing Mark's tale next week and then concluding it during the following episode. I'd like to thank Danielle Hewitt again for lending her wonderful voice to these episodes. For any of you that don't want to wait to hear the rest of this story, you can purchase a digital or physical copy on Amazon. Until next week, listeners, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by Eric Peabody and Craig Groshek. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. Seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising, I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend becoming a patron? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cabal. That means all of Otis Jiry's scary stories told in the dark, Drew Blood's Dark Tales, Paul J. McSorley's Fear from the Heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me personally, I'm on most social media as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you.